Okay, if everybody's settled, we'll uh, go ahead. We haven't done a thesis defense in a while, especially uh, in person, so it's good. To, uh, so with uh, no more ado, we'll uh, turn it over to Andrew to tell us about his thesis work, which is evaluation of low-cost low LED lights as sole source light for production of bib lettuce and aquaponics. Hey, Thank you guys for being here today. So my name is Andrew Lohman, and we'll be talking about my thesis today. So first, uh, it'd be worthwhile to talk about what is aquaculture. As most people in the room are probably aware of aquaculture, just to cover the basis. Aquaculture is the culture of aquatic organisms in controlled or semi-controlled conditions, or simply put, underwater agriculture. Here we have some tilapia from my study on both sides, and then some prawn harvest that we did here at KSU. And then just an example of some other species that are uh, produced in aquaculture. Within aquaculture, there's a lot of different types of systems that we use. Uh, we have more extensive systems on the top and more intensive systems on the bottom. Uh, we have some net cages for salmon production here, um, some ponds for catfish production down in the south, and then some trout farms um, out in Idaho for trout production. On the bottom row here, we have more intensive production uh, of shrimp indoors, uh, those same salmon indoors and recirculating aquaculture systems, and then aquaponics is a subset of recirculating aquaculture. And within um, these aquaculture systems, extensive and intensive is just uh, determining how much of the uh, system environment is being contributed by the natural environment. So in extensive systems, more of the dissolved oxygen, uh, waste, waste removal, and temperature is being supplemented um, through the environment, whereas in more intensive systems, all of those parameters are being supplemented um, by the producer in those settings. And as I said, aquaponics is going to be a combination of circulating aquaculture as well as uh, hydroponics. So what is aquaponics? Aquaponics is a combination of a fish and plant culture where the fish are eating um, and they're producing a waste that then gets filtered um, and then distributed to the plant culture. And the plants are being grown in a hydroponic medium, which is a soilless medium. And they are going to be removing those wastes that the fish are producing uh, specifically nitrate, as nitrate is one of the things that accumulates within recirculating really aquaculture systems typically, and we want to, aquaponics is a, a way to reduce that nitrate accumulation within the system. So once the plants have that water that passes through them, they then return the water back to the fish and it repeats the cycle in a closed loop system like this. So there are a couple of different types of aquaponics systems. We have the nutrient film technique, we have the deep water culture floating rafts, and then the media beds or ebb and flow goes by many different names. But the basic principles of the nutrient film technique is that water enters into the trough here. It's basically like a rain gutter and there's a very thin film of water along the bottom. And the plant roots are growing in that thin film of water um, and the leaves are growing out the top and the water returns back to the fish tank having that nitrate removed. Um, in the floating raft or deep water culture systems, you have water entering into a large container or trough um, that has uh, a water depth of anywhere between eight to 12 inches with the roots floating in that uh, medium suspended in it and then the plants on top of it, usually with a, some sort of styrofoam board um, to float the plants on top of that and then it's returned back to the fish tank again. Um, and then finally is the media field. It's usually some sort of media, some inert media, um, be it expanded clay pebbles, um, expanded shale, uh, river rock pebbles, just dependent upon the, the type of the producer wants to use and the, the actual accessibility to that that they have. Um, with this, the water comes in, it comes up, raises into the bed, and then once it hits this standpipe here, it overflows, creates a siphon, and then drains the water all the way back down so that the roots are constantly being flooded with water and oxygen, and then the water returns back to the fish tank having the nitrate removed. So these plants, unlike our fish, need to have specific types of light to be actually able to thrive within the system. Um, and generally that light is referred to as PAR, which is photosynthetic active radiation, um, and that's between 400 and 700 nanometers. Um, specifically in that is blue light and red light and 400 and 500 are the most important for chlorophyll and uh, are more targeted within the realm of artificial lights um, for producers. Um, there's also some more research than recently. I'm looking at the red blue ratios of that red light to blue light and that that ratio uh, seems to have a very important impact on the plant production. So in 2019 they uh, had a study that looked at the red blue ratio. Okay. <laughs> They looked at the, the red blue ratio of the lights uh, of four to 4.5 compared to 1.73. And statistically, there was no difference between the two. Um, but in terms of production, there was about 20% greater production, which for a producer, that's a quite large increase um, in production, even if it isn't statistically significant um, in the study itself. So that big, so then uh, subsequently also there is PPFD, which uh, I just want to talk about and distinguish between R and PPFD. So PAR is photosynthetically active radiation, and that is what is being emitted by that light 
at the where it's being produced. Whereas PPFD is going to be what light is actually hitting that plant at the plant canopy. Um, and it's per millimoles per meter squared per second in a single spot location. Um, whereas PAR is usually just a conglomeration of all the different types of light between 400 to 700. PPFD allows you to be able to see what type of red light you have in there, what type of blue light, what type of green light, and allows you to differentiate out those specific light spectrums that PAR does not allow you to necessarily do. So to provide this type of light, um, they're normally provided by a couple of different artificial sources, um, fluorescence, little halides, high-pressure sodium, induction, and more recently, LEDs or light-emitting diodes. Um, and then over here, we have some examples of what applications they would be in. Uh, in the greenhouse, they can be supplementary lights um, to provide light in off seasons or to extend out your daily light integral um, for specific crops or specific operations. And then indoors, they're acting as a sole source of light um, for production um, with whatever crops you're growing. And they are being supplemented by any external daylight. So within um, Kentucky here, for tempered aquaponics, a lot of the research that's been done in aquaponics has been done in tropical environments um, where they don't have to necessarily worry about the same parameters and constraints that we have here. They have year-round um, light, heat, and consistent climate, um, whereas here we have winter that we have to deal with. We have to take into account the decreased light and the decreased heat um, within our growing system. So with that in mind, we have to start thinking about either going inside of a greenhouse or inside of an insulated building. Um, and inside of a greenhouse, like I said earlier, we can supplement that light um, through the winter season as well as supplementing heat, or we can go entirely indoors and insulate the entire building and be able to provide all of the artificial light for the plant production within the system. And both of these are rather large infrastructures. They require a large amount of profitable expense and can be cost prohibitive for producers to actually um, start looking at using light um, either indoors and inside of greenhouses. Because inside of, uh, inside of insulated buildings, sorry, um, lighting can account for almost 20% of the startup capital cost of an aquaponics farm. So that can be uh, a, a large chunk to bite off of, especially when you're considering that a single light here, which is a typical horticultural LED light, um, can be about $1,400 a light. And that is, uh, can be very limiting for people who want to produce greens within a system. Um, so we are here is a very good picture of the actual entire study. Um, you have a $1,400 light here, and then right next door to it, you have a $130 light. Um, and we were actually walking around the system the first time. And Dr. Tidwell said, so this is a great summary of what your entire thesis is. And so this is the picture of that great summary of what my entire thesis is. Um, so you can see here the very vigorous growth between the two different um, lights here. One thing to note, especially about some of these horticultural LED lights, is that they don't have any white light or green light within the, the spectrum. Um, so what that means is that you have this purple color on your leaves. You're not able to see the leaves as well as you would if the light has some white or some green in there to be able to actually see the actual green of the leaves. And that has a very important impact on uh, looking at disease pressure, um, the disease pest pressure, nutrient deficiencies. So that coloration um, is a very good first indicator of deficiency that we're seeing. And if we have a hard time seeing those deficiencies in this type of light, it makes it a lot harder for the producer to actually be able to combat um, those issues that they're having. So talking about LEDs and their expense, there's actually some a study that was looking at comparing LED lights to double-ended high-pressure sodiums. And they were looking at a five-year total cost of the light system. So they were looking at the purchase cost of the lights compared to also the operational cost of the lights. And the LED lights were about five to 10 times more than the high-pressure sodium lights. And the overall five-year production, um, LED lights showed to be about two to three times more, 2.3 times actually more expensive to operate and to run compared to high pressure sodium lights. And the main reason that they found for that increased cost of operation was the increased cost at the beginning of the purchasing. So that five to 10 times more expensive than high pressure sodium, they're the same efficiency, but that was what caused that 2.3 times more expensive. So if we can lower that capital cost of the LED lights, we can be able to have all the advantages of LED lights without that increased capital cost um, for there. And that's sort of a misconception in LED lights is that they're always better. Um, but in this case, LED lights were not necessarily the best option because while they were as efficient as the high pressure sodium lights, the total cost of operating over five years was a lot more expensive and could be prohibitive from somebody wanting to get LED lights and all the advantages that they have, um, meaning longer life, um, more control over the spectrum, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so previous research at KSU has actually looked at um, some different, these, these different lighting technologies, specifically metal halide, fluorescent induction, and light emitting diodes. Um, and you can see here, in all cases of the 
This is just a subsection of all the ones that we've grown. Um, but in romaine, pot choy, and pollards, uh, LED lights here is on the left. And then you have the other three lights here. And you can see the, the growth difference um, in these and the significant difference between LEDs and the other three lighting uh, technologies. Um, and in all cases, they prove to be more energy efficient and more productive in each one. Uh, so the background for this, which all that aside, there was actually an anecdotal experiment done um, that was looking at using a shop light to overwinter um, some tropical plants indoors. And in that in, indoor overwintering, the plants actually grew on, put a lot more leaves and starting to flower. And the success of that anecdotal experiment uh, begs the question of whether or not agricultural crops could also be produced underneath these same lights. So a 21 day trial was run looking at um, varying heights to see what would be best. And if that production underneath those varying heights would be comparable to a benchmark horticultural control that we've done previously. So this is that data here. Uh, we have our heights at 10 inches off the board, 15 inches off the board, 20 inches and 25 inches. And then our bottom here is a benchmark. Um, this is using the same lettuce variety um, from Schultz in 2021. Um, and you have your best production here at 20 inches off the board. And you have a uh, 4,300 4, grams production and 5,400 grams production. Now, the, there, is a, there is a difference there. Um, but that difference, um, the light here that we're looking at is an $80 light. Whereas the benchmark light here is that control light that we have is a $1,400 light. So this $80 light is able to produce about 80% of the growth of the control light that we have, um, which led us to think that if we actually looked at some more different types of lighting technologies or different types of LED lights, we'd potentially be able to match this type of production uh, with the experimental uh, low cost LED light. So for our criteria for choosing our lights, we wanted to make sure that the lights were about a third the cost of the control. So less than $400. We want to make sure they can be easily purchased by anybody, meaning that they were purchased from Lowe's, Home Depot, Amazon, um, online light shops, and they didn't require a specific um, commercial like partnership with a lighting company that sometimes is prohibitive um, when looking at horticultural lights. Um, we also tried to have as varied of light spectrum as possible to hit those red-blue ratios um, that I mentioned previously, um, to try to have uh, regular ratios that matched more than control and anything. ones that matched um, a lower end that spectrum. And we used Calvin to try to have that very spectrum, um, but unfortunately did not work out. And you see that in the next slide that uh, Calvin was not a good indicator of um, the actual spectrum, uh, the regular ratio within the lights. And then finally, the other thing was could they reasonably cover a four foot by two foot growing area, which is what our aquaponic systems are. So each of the systems was in a four foot by two foot area and the light couldn't adequately cover that, it didn't make the cut. So these are the eight lights that we ended up with, uh, starting at the top with the lowest cost, and then at the bottom with our control, and then with fluence, um, our highest experimental light. And you can see here on the right-hand side, all of these lights had fairly varied Calvin ratios, um, but you can see with the exception of the King, they're all, you have 1.2 to 2.75, and then you have a 6.63 down here. Um, so Calvin was not a very good indicator to choosing a very good ratio. And so these are the systems that I was talking about the lights are going to be going into. So this is all the details information of the systems. Um, we have a fish tank here, our primary solids filtration here, secondary solids to collect our fine solids, and then our plant system here. Each one of these containers, or A, B, C, and D, are divided using black plastic. Um, so A was entirely separate from B, from C, and D, and then between each system, there is plastic enveloping each one, so there's no light contamination between the different light treatments. Um, additionally, when you start enclosing everything with plastic, you also want to make sure you have adequate ventilation or movement of air through the system because normally you have that going through the entire system. So there are fans above each one of these lights to make sure that there is adequate airflow through the systems. Um, so our first trial was uh, 15 days and we evaluated those eight lights and we had three replications per light. Um, and they were all standardized to 200 PPFD. Um, these lights are not necessarily indicative of the heights that they were at or to take adequate pictures. Some of these lights had to be raised up quite high to actually be able to show um, the lettuce underneath it. Um, and you have uh, your worldwide light here, which is about 46 inches off the board for 200, about 24 inches for the Neo. Your designers was about 10 inches off the top of the plants. Um, Fluence was about 14 inches, and then Spire Farmer was also uh, about 24 inches off the board. And then the King and Grow Star over here were about, um, they varied quite heavily depending on their growth, but they're about 20, 25 inches, as well as the, the Rural King was very similar to the designers and the fluence and that it was about 10 inches off the board. So that's, a, that's about that high off the plant canopy, um, just to give you some reference. 
So in our trial one, we stocked it to 5,200 grams with um, tilapia that weighed on average 218 grams. Um, we also fed the tilapia at a rate of 60 grams per meter squared per day, which worked out to about 160 grams or 80 grams um, twice daily. Um, the plants were stocked 15 per quadrant down here. So there were 15 total plants in each one for a total of 60 plants per system. And the average starting weight was 1.7 grams. Um, an important thing just to note, as we have this picture up here, down here at the bottom, uh, the, the way that we were looking at our representative samples uh, was in the center part of the light. So we didn't take any samples for our um, representative samples from the exteriors of it, but rather what was directly underneath the light for all the lights um, to make sure that we had the best light quality in there and that we weren't getting um, different plants from different areas that would have potentially very large differences. We want to try to have it be as controlled as possible for when comparing those representative samples. Um, down here is just the plants going in, making sure the plants get into the net cups. And then I don't know if you guys noticed this, but there's a tilapia currently jumping out of the bowl directly for Dr. Tidwell, who is very unknowing of what is about to happen. <laughs> um, so the most important thing with this, this state, this, this study was the data collection, specifically the PPFD. So twice weekly, we're taking our spectrometer across seven points within the system, and we're making sure that they were averaging out to about 200 plus or minus five on each side. So if the light was too low or too high, we would adjust it based on the type of light that it was. So lights that were not adjustable, that didn't have the ability to increase or decrease intensity, we raised or lowered. And lights that could be adjusted, we simply kept at the same height and brightness of those were adjusted for the intensity. Um, in addition to all those things that I mentioned, we also looked at water quality daily, um, meaning temperature, dissolved oxygen, pH, and electrical conductivity. And then in addition to twice weekly with the PPFD measurements, we also looked at plant heights, as well as water quality for ammonia, nitrate, nitrate, alkalinity, and iron. And these plants are harvested after 15 days. And this is what the plants look like on the final day before they're harvested. So you see how large they were in a span of 15 days, which was very atypical for uh, lettuce within our systems. Um, the statistical analysis for the study was a two-way ANOVA to determine if the lights impacted different growth parameters of plants, and if there was differences observed, least significant difference was used to see what lights differ significantly from one another. And so here are the results. The top here is our control, um, and then we have our subsequent ones. Uh, designers fluence growth are going down, uh, and then the unit price that we in the very end. So you can sort of look through here as I talk, uh, looking at the production of biomass for the different light um, costs. Um, but within the control compared to the stuff, compared to the other experimental lights, um, in biomass, there is only a significant difference between King and Neo. And again, in, in, in individual um, weight, it was also, again, Neo was not significantly different than a majority of the lights and it was only significantly different from King down here at the bottom. So the first one that we're looking at to see visually is the average total biomass. So we have, again, Neo on the far left here as our control, and you have four of the lights that are not significantly different, and the two that are also not significantly between the Neo and the lowest one, but Neo is significantly different than the lowest one, which is King here. And that's the, the same thing here again. Neo was not significantly different than all of the other lights except for King, um, and Fluence ended up having the best average representative uh, weight uh, out of all the eight treatments. And then finally, our production per unit energy of electricity. So this tells us how many grams of lettuce are produced in an area with a certain amount of electrical usage per day. Um, so NEO um, was, again, our control and our experimental down here, uh, was significantly lower than three of our experimental ones, and then was significantly higher than three of our other ones, and was the same with only one of our other lights. Just to give you an idea of, um, this tells us how many kilowatt hours were utilized by the lights, uh, and it also takes into account how much production is produced with that kilowatt hours that were utilized. So those two parameters, the total biomass and grams per meter squared per kilowatt hour, were used in our ranking system to determine what lights moved on to the second trial. So among our eight lights, we decided to do a rank sum, and the highest number or the highest value for a particular area was we receive a value of one and another one here. So you have a total score of two, and the lowest score is the best score, and that uh, means that it had the best production and the uh, grams per meter squared. And so we went through all of these and tied them up. So we have our fluence, which went through, our neo, which went through, our designers, even though it had a rank of six for production, it had the second, it had tied for first um, with the efficiency of producing lettuce underneath that amount of energy. And then finally, our uh, final one, Spider Farmer, was a three way tie between this one, the Grow Star, and the Rural King. And what we ended up doing was looking at the standard deviation 
of the PBFD value. So that's telling us how varied that spectrum, how varied that light dispersion across the board was. So I can say just from memory that the rural king, for instance, in some areas would have 300 and near the center of those five plants, and on a corner it might have 120. So one of the qualifications for these lights is that it could reasonably cover a four foot by two foot growing area. And that standard deviation is telling us that these lights in comparison to the spider farmer did not do a very good job of covering that four foot by two foot growing area. So that's why spider farmer went into the second trial here. And so the second trial, again, just to remind us of the cost of these lights and the revenue ratio and the amount of kilowatt hours used in a 16 hour period. We have all that here with individual plants um, and lights here, and then the starting heights for this particular study. And again, spider or designers and fluence would again be probably closer to down here where that um, oh, what hygrometer is. Um, and then these guys are where they actually would be during the course of the study. So in our second study, we utilized a complete block design um, for our four lights that we had. So each light was within a different part of the system. So fluids is in A here. It would be in B in this system here. It would be in spot C in this system here and spot D in the system here. And that would allow for any changes in nutrient concentration as the water is moving through the systems. That if there's any differences observed, all four lights would have the same spots. We'd be able to have still a good statistical analysis at the end of the study. And again, these lights are all standardized to 200 PPFD across seven spots, and they had to do within plus or plus or minus five of 200. So they you have the 200 fiber down to 195, and if they're outside that range, we adjust the lights accordingly. Um, within this study, we utilize the same fish from our first one. So they were much larger at this point, which is less than ideal, but given the situation, we didn't have access to smaller juveniles, so we could make do with what we had. They were still fed that 60 grams per meter square per day, which led to 160 grams per day and or 80 grams uh, at each feeding twice a day. And then the plants were stocked the same 15 plants per light, and then 0.23 grams um, for the starting uh, plant weights. And again, the light quality data was collected again. The only difference this time around was that adjustments were made by raising or lowering the lights entirely, and they were not adjusted um, based on the ability for the lights to be able to be turned up in intensity or turned down in intensity. That way, when we came back and looked at the electrical data, um, we wouldn't have issues with uh, a spider farmer or a neosol being turned down and its energy use is decreasing, but that it's keeping that same energy use as constant over the same time period and it's not tampering with that data at the end of the study. Um, so again, we also looked at water quality, which is temperature DO, pH, and EC, and then the plant heights and water quality again. And this time, the plants were harvested um, 17 days after they were put into the systems. And again, uh, statistical analysis for this was two-way NOVA, um, and if differences are observed, we looked at the least significant difference to separate those um, and see what was significant. So here um, is the results from the second trial. The second trial, all the things that are in yellow are all the ones that are significant differences between them. Um, this here is just this scaled up to a full meter squared um, system rather than our 0.56 meter squared system. Um, so we can see here that in our first trial, NEO and designers were not significantly different from one another. But in the second trial, they did separate out and NEO was significantly different from designers in terms of its total biomass. Um, but NEO is not significantly different than fluence or spider farmer up here. Um, you can also see here the average kilowatt hours per day utilized. Designers was had the least amount of uh, kilowatt hours used, um, and then fluence and spider farmer were also um, significantly different, but the same classification. And then our control used the most energy um, per day of production. And then so the biomass and the average kilowatt hours informs this last one here, which is the plant weight produced by kilowatt hours. As you can see here, designers again had the highest production and Neo had the lowest production. Um, other, other things that we looked at when we're doing plant studies is also looking at four foot index. And this is taken at the end of the study to see, uh, uh, to give an approximation of the activity of chlorophyll within the plants. And there's no significant difference there, as well as leaf surface area gives us an idea of how large our plants were and if there's uh, differences in their um, overall you know, composition or demeanor. Um, if they were thicker leaves and shorter, or if they were longer leaves and taller, you'd be able to look at the total biomass and the leaf surface area and have an idea of what that would look like, but there's no significant differences there. And then no significant differences in root to shoot. And then unit cost, again, just to give an idea of where we're looking at. So just visually, all three of these here are the same. So there's no significant differences between the representative wet shoot weights, which were those five plants um, in the center of the, 
the, the lights, which give an indication of what those lights could be able to produce in a system where you have overlapping lights. So in our system, we didn't have lights bumped up one next to another, um, but in a commercial setting, you'd be able to have uh, a light here, a light here, like, and that light would be overlapping and you'd be in theory be able to get a uh, similar distribution across the entire area. So that's why representative wet shoots, rep, that's why those representative uh, plants were used. The average total biomass again here, um, you can see the significant difference between the NEO and the designer, but again, nothing between um, the NEO sole and the two other experimental lights. And then the inverse over here, the NEO sole is significantly different, significantly less efficient than designers for production per unit electricity. So with all this to say now, these results outside of, huh? <laughs> so all of these uh, results um, are using, so all of these results that we have here are now letting us inform us how well these lights would be able um, to be able to replace those neosols, the control lights on an economic basis. So we looked at a partial budget analysis for our um, way to evaluate that. And it's a management tool um, to compare the cost returns affected by the potential change in business. So this is used in a lot of different agricultural settings. It's usually looked at one specific application. So you're only changing one parameter within your system or one particular thing. You could change feed, you could change the fuel you're using, or you can change lighting in this situation. Um, and we'll go into what the, all of this is in the next slides here. So the, the two aspects of the partial budget analysis are looking at the net change in total profits and then the benefit cost ratio uh, which is just the total benefits here subtracted by the total cost, and then the total benefits here divided by the cost. Um, and so a value for the benefit cost ratio greater than one would indicate that, that making that change for uh, that particular experimental control light would be more advantageous to do than the previously used um, control, previously used control light than USO in this case. So this will make more sense when I actually show you uh, the actual breakdown of what a typical one would look like. So we have our designer's lights here compared to our NEO, and our additional costs are what costs are going to be associated with purchasing that designer's lights and using that designer light. So we are having a $100 purchase cost with a $49 operational cost per year, and we're losing out on a $107 production from that NEO sole um, in lettuce production over that course of that year. So we have a total cost of $257. On our benefits here, we have our production that will be produced by designers in that one year time span. We have a reduced cost of not purchasing the Neosol, and we have a reduced cost of not operating the Neosol for that year. So that totals out to a total of $1,500. So down here, we have our net change in profits of 1562 minus 67 for a value of 1300, and then the benefit cost ratio of 15 divided by 257. And the, the larger this number is down here, the more advantageous it is. The benefit is more than the cost of the, the system. So it's more advantageous to change it in that. So all three of these are the experimental lights that we're looking at. So designers had the greatest benefit cost ratio and the greatest net change in profits, as well as the phytopharma influence, though, also were very good changes to be made uh, compared to the control light that we had here in terms of their operation and what they could potentially produce in that two foot by four foot area that we had. Um, and you can see down here, all of the values, again, just laid out uh, between NEO versus Phytopharma versus fluids and so forth. So the, this, this trial, the studies demonstrated that the low cost LED lights could perform just as well in terms of biomass production and energy efficiency um, and showed that rugby ratio did not actually have that large of an impact in our study on the production of the plants. So you can see here, the red blue ratio of the different lights, they're all significantly different from one another. And there's no significant difference between the top three um, plants up here, or lights up here from our control, which is the NEO, to our spider farmer influence. So we might have to see if we can't find some more lights that are more similar to NeoSol and are less expensive in cost to see if it still pans out that way. Um, and then also finding that very red blue ratio is also a lot more difficult and challenging than anticipated for this study. And the partial budget analysis showed that we could replace all three lights, all three of these lights could replace our control light as viable replacements that you wouldn't have a decreased cost or decreased amount of production or revenue for the farmer at the end of the day. Additionally, uh, no lights did prove to be the best. There was, each light had its own strengths and weaknesses and would be more better situated for a particular environment. And we're gonna talk about that right now. Um, so for instance, this Neosol will be, uh, I'll just, we'll go through. Uh, so, in terms of what type of lights would be best, the fluence and designer, because they were very low off the ground, 
very low off the plants. Um, they'd be more suited for a vertically stacked system where you can have plants, light, plants, light, and just continuing to go up and up. Um, and because they're not adjustable, once you set those lights in place once, you can just continue your production through there and not have to worry about thinking about, I have to change my lights for a different plant height, and it's just set it once um, and forget it. Whereas the spider farmer and Neosol, um, they are able to cover a much larger area of production. And we're gonna see that in the, the trial that we did at Food Chain uh, as an application of this research here. So they, and they could cover a four foot by four foot area a lot easier than, those news, than the designers and fluents could. So you can be able to raise this up higher, turn up the intensity and be able to cover a larger swath of area. Um, and you could also lower it and drop it down depending on the crops that you're producing. So it gives a lot more flexibility um, for the farmer but that flexibility also comes with increased energy uses. The higher you raise it up, the more energy it takes to reach that set value um, at the bottom for the plants canopy can actually absorb. Um, so conclusions were that two lights, the spider farm and fluence, were not each yielded equal growth to the control light, the neosol. Um, the designers, will, however, produced significantly less growth than the neosol, but in terms of production per unit of electricity, um, it was greater than that. And over an extended growth period, that value of the amount of growth that you're having per electrical unit um, can be very important and can make or break a farm if you are having a large discrepancy um, in that area of um, growth per uh, unit of electricity used. And then all three lights in total cost a fraction to purchase and operate from the neosol and all the different parameters. Um, so some future research that we would want to do with this trial uh, with this study, we'll be looking at a large scale farm trial to compare um, these low cost LED lights in a more commercial setting where you have a larger span and the lights are being pushed more to their limits. Uh, we'd also wanna see if we can determine some different characteristics to have um, a better idea of what the spectrum of the lights are so that when people are going out purchasing these lights, they are able to have a more informed opinion about, okay, this particular parameter of a light is very important if I want to have this type of red blue ratio or this type of um, environment that I'm trying to produce in. Also, since some of these plants were, or some of these lights rather, were used in situations that would not be um, subjected to high humidity environments, a lot, so, so three of these lights were for like shop lights over your bench in your garage or for high bay lights in a uh, commercial setting, they're not gonna have high humidity and they're not gonna have high temperature. Um, so we'd have to see long-term how viable these lights are in those type of environments because that could definitely corrode and deteriorate those lights quicker if they don't have the proper um, waterproofing or water resistance that is typical with uh, horticultural LED lights. And finally, testing these lights against fruiting crops because um, this study was looking at vegetative crops. Um, but it would be very interesting to see how well these low-cost LED lights are performing for, say, pepper plants or tomatoes or cucumbers and if they could actually support that type of growth, which the other light, the control light, could be able to do. So to the application of a large, large farm scale trial, we went to Food Chain, which is an indoor aquaponic farm, to test out five of our lights um, in their system. And so these, these systems here are four foot wide and 40 feet long, and there's four of them. And we hijacked this one over here for our study. And they didn't quite like it because it looked like this. And they have tours that come through. And uh, it's not very appealing to see a black wall of plastic uh, when you're supposed to be highlighting uh, aquaponics, but they may do for a couple of months while we were there trying out our different lights. Um, so the five lights that we utilize in this, we added in uh, the fifth light here, which is wide. Um, and I'm not gonna go all the way back to the slides, but the wide um, seems to suggest that it would be very good in a larger um, environment because it had a very even spread over the entire four foot by two foot area. So it had about a standard deviation of about 11 or 10. Um, so that means that it was going down to 190 and up to 210, which would suggest that in a larger area, that same light could be able to disperse across it, but uh, it didn't perform very well. Uh, and the other four were from my second trial, um, the control over here with the NEO, and then the three experimental lights over here. Um, and just to give you an idea of where we were getting our information from for our net change in profits and partial budget analysis, um, we were assuming that the price per pound of lettuce was $2.5 uh, per pound. Uh, the cost for electricity was 11 cents per kilowatt hour, that we would get 20 cycles per year, and that the electrical cost per year is that. And then you end up with the, the values of the actual fixture costs. So within this, uh, so we did three trials at Food Chain. The first two were um, less than ideal. Um, so we ended up learning um, that the designers and the fluence here 
could not support a four foot by four foot growing area that we had to add in a, a second light to be able to have an adequate spread across the, the boards uh, within the system. So that's why the cost here is increased to 200 and to 728 from 100 and 364 in our other trials. So this, just keeping this in mind, this is going to impact that partial budget analysis because we're increasing that initial capital cost with these two different lights. So this is just a practical representation of that data. This was not a replicated study, so we don't have any significant differences, but you can just see here a grouping up here of these three lights and then why it's down here by itself. And then fluence, even with those two lights, is splitting the difference, but it's still not near the production of those other three lights. Um, and then the benefit cost ratio, um, just to, we'll just briefly show this and then I wanna compare it to the KSU study when we were looking at um, the same stuff at KSU on a smaller scale, just to see how it shakes out when you start looking at a, a larger area of growing. So we have, um, again, this time around, the fluence is no longer with the spider farmer anymore. And the designers has significantly, has, has dropped quite large from where it was before at six down to three. Um, but when you go over to the net change in profits, they all are still very beneficial to change over from Neosol from that perspective. Um, $1,000 plus for three of them, and then the $600 here for the fluence. Um, and a large majority of these costs that we're seeing here is from the Neosol's purchase price. So when we first purchased that Neosol and was operating it, that's what a large majority of this cost here is um, being consumed by. And so you can see here the, the change and the net change in profits between KSU on the left and food chain on the right. So spider farmers stayed the same, designers roughly the same, but then Fluence took a hit when it went to that larger area and had to have that second light um, to produce um, a same, to cover that same area that the other lights were able to uh, cover. And then here again, so this drop here and this drop here were about a 55% drop between KSU to food chain. And that is mainly accounted for by that um, increase in the second light that we had to put for both designers and for fluids. But you can still see here that even with that second light, designers is still the most advantageous one to, to use in the, in the larger scale system. But at food chain, production isn't the only thing that they're worried about. They are also a very public entity that has a couple thousand to 5,000 people coming through each year. And they are concerned about things that aren't necessarily concerning for typical farmers. So they're, they're wanting to have an environment that is easily photographed by visitors and by staff. So that way they can put out um, social media posts or videos or things of that nature. And there's a uniformity to their, to their farm. And it's not a, a bunch of, you can see back here, on this side over here, the purple light. When you have all those different light colors, it makes it very difficult to take good photos or good videos within a system. And as they are more of a demonstration as well as a production system, they want to be able to showcase what an aquaponic farm can look like or aquaponic production can look like. So while the designers was the most um, beneficial one in terms of the analysis, in terms of the aesthetics of the actual farm, um, those also are a consideration that have to be taken into account when looking at these um, lights. So as I said before, um, for instance, the designers would have to be about 12 inches off the board. So you just come in and there'd be a wall of lights and there'd be plants underneath them, but you couldn't be able to see the lights. And if you're coming through for a tour, that's not going to be very interesting to just look at a bunch of white metal sheets and some green stuff underneath. But with the spider farmer, they're able to raise those up high off the boards. And so that way people can be able to actually look and see and not be inhibited by the lights there. And it's more of a, a sleeker design um, and is a lot less noticeable. Additionally, they, I don't know if we'll be able to see it in this, we'll be able to see it here. So at the top here, they actually have a light looper, um, which is a, a moving system that is a motor that's basically moving the lights back and forth. So that we can utilize less lights in the system um, because you're constantly moving them across that area. Um, and they couldn't actually use their light looper with the uh, design or with the neosols, the controls that we have, because they're too heavy and they're burning out their motors. So by using and purchasing the spider farmers, which you can see over in this corner here, they're very, very thin profile, very, very small in comparison to these guys here, which are the neosols. Um, additionally, we can see the color change. So this is with their it's just slew of different types of lights there with that orangish color, which makes it very difficult when you have this color here, you have your purple color here, you have your white lights here, and you have your other yellow lights. I'm colorblind, so there's some <laughs> colors here that you guys are probably seeing that I'm not necessarily seeing. So he's like, hey, there's colors you're not seeing. That's why. Um, but along the back here, you can see that difference in terms of that color. And that's what the entire farm is going to look like, is that white light. And it's going to be a lot easier for people to photograph and be able to enjoy that. Because working and being in an environment that has this harsh lighting is, uh, is harsh, uh, to, put it, to put it bluntly. Um, and whereas this is a very 
easy on the eyes type of light that isn't, you don't even realize that it's there until you start looking at the actual light system. So I'd like to thank Dr. Tidwell for all of his help and support over these last three years uh, with my thesis and my classes, uh, as well as Dr. Ray and Dr. Simmons for you guys' help with my thesis and all the edits associated with that, um, providing feedback to be able to better inform uh, in my paper, as well as within this presentation. And thanking Janelle for all of her work throughout the three years, um, helping me get familiar with aquaponics, being there for when systems had inevitably had problems and all the associated things that go wrong in aquaponic systems, as well as Josh, if you're watching virtually, I don't know if you are, thank you for all your help with the preliminary trials and studies that went along with that. Um, it made it a lot more bearable going around doing PPFD with somebody else. As Chris knows, thank you for your help as well with that, because doing it by yourself for, so, so just to give an idea of why I'm saying this, uh, each one of these systems would take probably about 45 minutes an hour on a good day. And you have six systems here and you're just doing the same thing over and over again. And if you didn't have somebody there, it could take eight to nine hours because you're doing all the writing by yourself. If you have somebody else there who loves misery as well, they can help you shorten that time and then make it a little more bearable when you start getting frustrated at a singular light over and over again because it was performing so poorly. Uh, I also like thank all the other graduate students here. Um, there's too many to really list out on a page like this. Thank you for all your support over the years and your friendship as well as my mom and dad for providing me the education to be here and most importantly, my wife for supporting me through these three years of master's school. I know it wasn't necessarily easy at times, uh, but I appreciate all the love and support that you gave. And with that, any questions? Yes. So as I recall, food chain actually switched over based on your research. Correct, they did, they switched yeah. switched over. Yep, so they, the based, thing. Yep, so they, um, they, they retired, they replaced their entire farm with those phytopharma lights. Um, and yeah, because of that study, they were very interested to see is they're at a stage in their farm where they had so many different lights that were constantly going out that they were looking at lights to replace it and they didn't necessarily know which one would be the best. Um, especially when you start comparing lights that are $1,400 to replace your lights that are failing and a light to $300. It's the difference between $40,000 and like $9,000 just rough math. So it makes a very large difference for a nonprofit. And then I remember also we went to visit River City on. Mm -hmm. They have this beautiful facility, fancy dancy greenhouse, and really couldn't afford to put lights and run. Correct. As if plants mm -hmm. didn't really, light wasn't that essential as all the other variables. And right. There was and that really brought it home that this, this could have an impact. Yeah. On really, folks trying to do this with it. And their problem was that they, uh, they had lights that were too expensive to operate. Yeah. Um, but they, the LED lights were too expensive to purchase. So they were in a spot where they had lights above their growing areas, but they couldn't even turn the lights on because the lights, the energy usage would outweigh the production value of those lettuce plants. So they were literally damn for you, damn for them. Correct. Yep. And in and, and that realm, their cycles for lettuce production greatly increased during the winter time to the point that they were, I think they're closer to like 60 or 65 days in the winter time compared to summer growth. Other questions? Yes, Leo. How relevant do you think your, your cost analysis actually is um, considering that one thing you said you were to do with your was say the longevity is like mm -hmm. So for instance, the neo zones, I know they're you know they're very expensive mm -hmm. to run, but you know, we've got your own old set that it will run for what three, four years. Mm -hmm. And we threw them over salt water and they're still surviving. Uh -huh. Right, like the worst environment. Right. And we've got the spider fibers as well, and there is no shielding on the mm -hmm. it's a fair board, and not that they're not good lights, right? But, you know, the long term performance of this is real question, correct? So, although the neo souls have you know that $1,400 mm -hmm. bid up front, right? Um, I mean, does the cost analysis really discount them that much because you know those lights have survived mm -hmm. going on well over half a decade in the worst environments you can put them, right? Versus the spider flowers, we really don't know that, right? right. So, I guess. How relevant do you think that? Because really, it's a one-year analysis. Sorry, that's a one-year analysis. Yes. Yeah. So yeah. How relevant do you think that is to the farmers? I think it's. I think it is relevant for people getting started. Um, given your situation with, with salt water, you're going to be putting it through a lot more abuse and yeah. trials. Um, whereas within a tr traditional aquaponics, you're not going to have that same corrosion with that salt going in there. And that's one of the things now that um, Food Chain has actually replaced all their lights with spider farmers. That's something that I want to look at going forward, or have somebody else look at going forward is how well those actually hold up. Because even if those lights only hold up for, say, four years, and the neosols hold up for 12 years, there's still, you're at almost the same comparable cost between there. If you start having 
uh, spider farm that goes for you know what it says fifty thousand hours, which is around nine years. That that cost difference there is definitely more justified. But it, that is a good point though to make that it is only one year analysis um, for that. But it's just sort of give an idea of what is capable over the long term and where majority of that cost is coming from. And it's majority of that cost is coming from not from the change in production, but from the change in your lighting that you're you're actually produce, or purchasing for your operation. And even with like the cost of the Neo Soul, like then you have to have an additional cost of building a structure that can hold yeah. 20, 40 pound lights. Yeah, you know, 40 so pounds, like yeah. that's, and then, yeah. you know, those Neo Souls, they don't even make them anymore. Yeah. You know, we bought $25,000 worth of lights and the company got bought up by another agriculture, another lighting company. And they're like, no, nope, you're our competition. Yeah, so I'm we're not, even. I'm not this kind of yes, yes. Yeah. Like, we, we encourage you to take the client as well. I like working with them. It would be easier. I was just curious because, yes. you know, the Neo Souls, they're a pain. Right. I mean, we've abused them yeah. and we've lost maybe like three you percent know, of the LED use service right. on there. They, they last, they're great. supposed to have a 70 percent reduction in uh, intensity after five years. That's kind of what they uh, running at 16 hours a day. Yeah. That's kind of what we figured. So that's still good. Yeah, they're still chugging along for us. <laughs> Nate, yes. Um, in your first trial, yes, you were just testing. A broad range of lights. Mm -hmm. It's why didn't you use the the, uh, the cheapest light, the rural cable light? Because it seemed like it. I could and I could be misunderstanding something, mm -hmm. but it seemed like it performed fairly well, mm -hmm. and you know, comparable to the other ones, and was the cheapest to buy, right. and the cheapest to run. Oh gosh. Let's see if I can go over it. Uh, so the main reason for that was was it just the coverage? The the coverage. So that was. So that final one, it was part of those three. It was the Rural King, the Grow Star, and the Spider Farmer. And between those three, the um, the Spider Farmer that that spread over the board was the, a lot lower than the Rural King. And so, like that light, when you start getting into the corners, of that light, you had plants that were extremely laggy or growing. You know, you just had a lot of variability. Correct. There's a large okay. amount of variability, and that's what that standard deviation was. Um, trying to account for was that yeah. it, it would give us an idea of what those outside uh, lights would look like. And that's why we didn't end up going with that. But it was it was tied for um tied for four or yeah. for the fourth spot. So then yeah. Like yeah. Yes. And then but then you know transferring that over into like a real world situation mm -hmm. like you all did at food chain. Yes. Even some of those lights you had to add an extra light Correct. on to, to get the coverage. Right. So we, if you added an extra one of the eighty dollars lights mm -hmm. to get that coverage. How would that compare, you know, price wise mm -hmm. with, with those lights? Right. So that so the Rural King and Designers here are very similar, and Designers was one of the ones that we used in that second trial, mm -hmm. and it was the still the best performing one, even with those two lights on that system in comparison to the production it produced, as well as the um, energy efficiency of that light. So even with those two lights and the benefit cost ratio and the net change in profits. It was still the best in both of those categories. It was just a matter of that at food chains, for instance, that light wouldn't have been very good for their environment where they're having tours coming through and having that. But for somebody who isn't caring about the aesthetics and is just producing, that light may be the best one, as well as maybe the rural king. Like I was saying, when you start having, when you have these individual blocks, it's hard to have that light covers that you normally have in a larger system. You're going to get that transfer over and that equal spread. Um, whereas in these systems, you don't have that luxury of having additional lights stacked on top of one another to counteract that. Yeah, and I'm just wondering, like, you know, it's the cheapest light, mm -hmm. it's the cheapest to run, mm -hmm. and it performed comparably. Right. I just didn't understand totally why you didn't transfer that into the set. Right. Well, we had four lights, and it was it came down to that standard deviation, of the, okay. that variability of the light is what we were looking for. And that's that's where I think in a larger, like, that light and the rural, the designer light and the rural king light are very comparable in their cost, and that they both need two lights to cover that area. Mm -hmm. And for someone again who isn't concerned about cost or about aesthetics of the place, that would be a very good option. It might be the best light. It might be yeah. the best light. One of those two lights might actually be the best light um, in those situations. But that's that's why it did not get on. And it also had the seventh level for biomass production, which did not help it moving into the next one. So yeah. yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. Other questions, Grace? Uh, you know. Land grant, especially 1890s land grant, we're supposed to do practical applied research that can immediately potentially impact farmers and address their problems. And I think this is actually a very good example of doing exactly that. We 
this has already been you spun out to uh, a farm and, and we see positive results of uh, returns and, and cost benefit ratios of, of several of these compared to uh, custom made horticulture lots. So that's, that's what it was about. Yeah. I, I was just going to say too that, that, you know, like ideally we would have had, you know, I think we had to like kind of pick different parameters mm -hmm. to use, you know, in the light. So I mean, we couldn't just test everything. And so I think that in looking at the way this is, the Neo Soul is considered a full spectrum light, which it takes you all the way from seedling to fruiting crop. Whereas something like this would be um, more of just like a vegetative growth for leafy greens. And so I think it would be interesting just not even as an experiment, but just to look at a white light control mm -hmm. that might be a horticulture LED light right. and compare it to, that would be more similar to the lights that we tested. Yeah. But we tried to get that range of red to blue ratio based on the Kelvin. So if you have a warmer light, you're you thinking, more red light. yeah, like a 3000 or 4000 right. light, it might be more red. The Neo Soul, Andrew said, is like a 1300 lumen. They don't make lights. Kelvin, <laughs> oh, Kelvin sorry. Oh, yeah. um, you know, so it, it didn't end up working out that way that we could use Kelvin as a way to judge mm -hmm. the ratio. So, yeah, I mean, we just kind of worked with what we had, but yeah, yeah great, great job, Andrew. Yeah. Any other questions? Mm -hmm. Good job.